you know, if you if you find that you're up and running and you, you don't, you're not going out and you think you should be, this is where you would go to check it first rather than checking the network settings inside the virtual machine itself you would do the you know inside inside the os on the virtual machine you would just do it right here and uh and the first thing i would do would be to switch between nat and bridge mode and when it's in bridge mode it will actually the 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 guest os will pick up its own ip address on the network and you can actually, so you could connect to the guest OS from your main OS if you wanted to. So if you were like experimenting building web servers uh, and web pages and you were running tests, you could run it in the virtual machine and access it from your guest OS, you know, or you could access it from a second virtual machine. So if you're like, okay, I want to make sure my web pages work equally well, uh, in Linux, Windows, Macs, and and mobile devices, and you have all of those either through a uh, virtual machine or uh, through an actual hardware, um, you can just test it from each one of those, and it doesn't matter whether the test is from a virtual machine or from um, an actual device, just as long as it's in bridge mode. And that, that's when it will pick up its own IP address and be seen by the rest of the network. Uh, a lot of the exercises that we'll be doing, it doesn't matter. Um, but I do have students that like to, especially when we start to do things like uh, SSH connections, um, then it can make a difference. Uh, and so pe people generally prefer to have it in bridge mode and it always defaults to NAT. So that's one of the things that you'll need to manually change if, if you're using VirtualBox. Um, the other thing about VirtualBox that everybody should be aware of is um, even if your processor is 64 bit, but it doesn't have the virtualization extensions, you can't run 64 bit OS inside the virtual machine. It has to be 32 bit. Um, if you have the, um, some BIOSes will have the, you'll have a processor that supports the, the virtualization extensions, but some BIOSes or, and some manufacturers have that turned off by default. So you may need to go in and turn it on. Um, you know, if you have like an i3 core, an i5 core, all of those uh, should support uh, the virtualization extensions. If you have like a Celeron processor, it will not. Uh, so it would be good, you know, if you're not sure, it would be good to become acquainted with what you have for a processor. And then um, you can just Google it and say, does this processor support virtualization extensions? Uh, but if it's any of the dual core, I think all of the dual core um, processor support virtualization extensions. So that shouldn't be an issue unless they're turned off in the BIOS. Um, now, let's see, I'm actually going to, I'm gonna turn that machine off. Say that again. What would happen if you installed it and you didn't have the the processor to uh, 
function out. Uh, you would get a message early on that would say, um, you know, you'd, you'd run the installer and it would say, your machine doesn't support 64 bit. You need to, you wouldn't even get to the install. You know, you would tell the installer to start, you know, right at that very first screen. And, you know, once it tried to attempt it to start, it would discover that it couldn't. And it would say, you need to do this on a, uh, 32 bit system. So, you know, and the shorthand um, for most of the 32 bits is either I386 or I586. So, 386 means in theory, the software would be able to run on a 386 machine, <laughs> which is really old. Um, and a 586 would require uh, a Pentium processor and uh so um so basically most machines nowadays can handle it <laughs> oh my shared window closed okay um let's see yeah exactly so it, yeah it'll tell you right away that there's a problem and this one I'm going to boot from hard disk and I'm going to do another share. So um, I just switched to a different install that I already have completed rather waiting for the other one. And I'm just waiting for it to boot. Is it time for a question while it's booting? Absolutely. Um, do we need the GUI? That's an excellent question. So if you're really sophisticated with the command line, no. Um, and, you know, there are Linux purists out there that think if you can't do everything from the command line, then you don't have any business running Linux, which I personally think is ridiculous. Um, you know, the Linux purists that feel that way typically are not overworked system administrators. <laughs> Uh, so here's my feeling about the GUI versus the command line. I take a very pragmatic approach. There are, I'm not a touch typist. There are some things that I do much faster in the command line. And so I always do them in the command line. And then there are some things that are kind of cumbersome for typing. And, uh, and Linux is very unforgiving. One typo and the command doesn't work. You know, it's case sensitive. So if you accidentally hit, you know, the shift key or caps lock, you got to back out of that and retype it. Um, so there are some things that if I can do it faster in the GUI, then I do it in the GUI. If, um, if I do it faster at the command line, I do it at the command line. Uh, you know, if you're a server jock and you're mainly running Linux servers and you want to have the maximum amount of resources available uh, on your server, then by all means, if you're, if you're comfortable with the command line, skip installing the GUI so that you don't have the overhead of the GUI running when you're not really using it. Um, what I often would do with a server is I would install the GUI, but I would set it so that I launch the GUI manually with the startx command as opposed to having the GUI 
load automatically. So I would log in, you know, as me or as root, depending upon what distro I'm running. And then I would type the command start X. Um, and that's only if I was doing something that I felt was much, just much simpler in the GUI than doing from the command line. Um, I'm pretty comfortable with the command line. So I do a lot at the command line. Uh, it's a matter of personal taste. Uh, you, you can do all of the exercises without the GUI. Uh, even if it says GUI, like, so sometimes it'll say go into YAST in some of these exercises. And YAST is a SUSE specific tool. It's kind of handy. It's a centralized location for server administration. And, uh, but there is a text mode version of YAST. So uh, you could run YAST um, without a graphic interface. And everything that you do in YAST, you can do from strictly from a command line as well and not use YAST at all. Um, I kind of like YAST because it's one-stop shopping. You know, um, if you're a server administrator who's working in uh, a heterogeneous environment, so maybe you got some Windows stuff running, you got some Linux stuff running, and maybe you also have a Mac OS server running, um, that's a lot of OSs to be familiar with. If you're an OS guy, I mean, I when I was working in full time in IT, I kind of prided myself on being an OS guy. Um, and back in those days, I was fluent.